Hey guys, Delman here with another Star Citizen history video. This one's just going to be a uh, a video on the Star Citizen ship manufacturers. Well, I will go over the ship manufacturers and whatnot, and uh, we can learn more about them together. So, let's jump right in. Crusader Industries. Crusader Industries headquarters is in the Stanton system. They use the United Empire of Earth's premier passenger freight transport development company. Crusader designs are produced in the Stanton system, but are a common sight throughout the galaxy. Ubiquitous with both private enterprise and military support roles. ELH-307 Genesis is Crusader's mid-range passenger spacecraft, which has found success in a variety of roles around the galaxy. Crusader produces a number of civilian space frames, ranging from small in-system commuter transports to high-capacity superliners. So these are the guys who made the uh, the Genesis Starliner, the uh, big transport ship, if you know which one that is. So with Kruger Intergalactic, there really isn't much information. The Kruger Intergalactic is a ship manufacturer and it produces the P-52 Merlin and the P-72 Archimedes under license for RSI, which is sold together with Constellations. Asperia. So Asperia manufactures the Prowler, a modernized version of the infamous Terravan boarding craft from the first Terravan war. With the recent discovery of the lost Terravan planet in the Cabal system, Asperia's engineers were given unmitigated access to examine the preserved ships found in several of the caches, before meticulously recreating the design choices. Esperia also manufactures replicas of the Vandal Blade Scythe for the UEEN, and they also provide refurbished glaives for the UEEN. Aegis Dynamics Aegis Dynamics was founded from a merger between Earth-based Aegis Microcomputing and Devon-based Dynamic Production Systems. With the explicit goal of constructing naval spacecraft, the firm was favored by Ivor Messer, and thus grew to prominence during the First Terravan War. During the Messer era, Aegis craft became synonymous with the ruthless, oppressive regime. After the fall of the Imperator, most of the Aegis military contracts were stripped, and the company seemed destined for bankruptcy with massive layoffs. However, the Aegis craft began to be adopted by civilians, repurposed for non-military uses. In turn, the firm was shifted, softening its image and focusing on civilian variants from their current generation designs. These days, Aegis only produces a few craft. The old Redeemer bombers have been repurposed for widespread use as deep space transport or hauling vessels. The Idris frigate, named after the Battle of Idris IV, has been demilitarized for private ownership, even though entrepreneurial pirate packs have been known to spring for one. So, some of the Aegis ships are the Avenger, the Gladius, the Idris, the Javelin-class Destroyer, the Reclaimer, the Redeemer, the Retaliator, the Saber, and the Vanguard. Consolidated Outlands Founded by the Maverick trillionaire Silas Corner, Consolidated Outland is an up-and-coming spacecraft concern. The first ever headquarters on a frontier world, Corner, who made his sizable fortune in jump communications, founded the company as an attempt to strike back at what he sees as the overly regulated spacecraft industry with facilities established as far as possible from prying eyes of competing corporations. Outland is quickly becoming one to watch. After finding initial success with spacecraft conversion kits, Outland is now ready to run with the big boys. The new Mustang spacecraft line is preparing to go into mass production, is prized to compete with Robert Space Industries' Aurora. Using the newly developed construction techniques and ultralight material alloys, sometimes considered unsafe. The Mustang pushes power ratios to the limit. The result is a sleek, stylish spacecraft that weighs less than the Aurora and has more options for engines and thrusters at the expense of some stability, weapons, hardpoints, and cargo capacity. So as you may have guessed, Consolidated Outland produces all of the Mustang variants. I hope to see more ships by Consolidated Outland in the future. I think it'd be pretty cool to see uh, a medium-sized ship from these guys. Origin Jumpworks History Origin Jumpworks was incorporated during the Glowing Age in Cologne, Germany, and was originally the producer of high-quality fusion engines for other ship manufacturers. However, after a decade of engine production, in 2889 the company moved to ship production, and the Lang brothers constructed the prototype of the X-3, Origin's first starship. 
Initially, the 200 and 300 series were revealed in 2899. For the first two decades, Origin's existence, it had strong ties to Earth. However, in 2913, company president Jennifer Friskers moved corporate headquarters and the primary design team to New Austin on Terra. Manufacturing has since been outsourced with only an engine testing facility remaining on Earth's moon. Origin has a strict anti-piracy policy with the company spending billions to counter piracy and refusing sales of 300 series ships to known pirates attempting to purchase craft from Origin in person. Ships that they have created are the X3, the 85X Runabout, the 890 Jump, 300 series, and the M50 and the 200 series. Drake Interplanetary's History Drake Interplanetary became incorporated soon after the Cutlass was reappropriated as a civilian craft. Having lost to the UEE contest in 2922, the purpose of the contest was to create a ship that could be constructed rapidly to outfit distant home defense squadrons in times of need. Jan Dredge became CEO along with a seven-member board which consisted mainly of designers that worked on the Cutlass. Drake was not the surname of anyone involved in the project. It was selected as an acceptably smooth-sounding name chosen specifically in the hopes that it would make their spacecraft more appealing. This was the first of a series of money over all decisions that quickly came to define the company. The second decision was also telling. Rather than incorporating one of the UEE traditional homeworlds like Earth or Terra, Drake based itself in the economically embedded system of Magnus, basing both corporate governance and key factories on Bora, Magnus II. Drake's outlaw image became well established before the first production model Cutlass left the factory floor. The initial pitch was to private military groups. The plan was that pi private squadrons in more distant areas of the galaxy would welcome low-cost spacecraft solution, regions specifically classified as high insurance risks. The Drake board reasoned would especially welcome an easier way to replenish lost spacecraft. Sales were phenomenal. Within nine months, Drake had opened six off-world factories and licensed dealerships in nine systems. In another year, the company had quadrupled again. Within five years, they were the fifth largest spacecraft manufacturing concern and couldn't license subsystem manufacturers quickly enough. The successful company was credited in the financial magazines as the little engine that could. Finally, a competitor that would change companies like Robert Space Industries and Mustachi Industrial ran their businesses. From the numbers alone, it looked like everyone would be flying a cutlass in 10 years. Drake's Crime Affiliation The question that soon became apparent regarding the cutlass sales was who was buying thousands upon thousands of these ships, and what were they doing with them? As long as the star credits kept coming in, no one at Drake was especially interested. The answer, of course, was pirate organizations. Now, thanks to the affordable cutlass, it was a new tool of choice for smugglers pirates. Long cut off from the standard insurance systems available to citizens had mostly been operating with obsolete discards. An armada of varied designs including the patchwork constellation Mark 1s, his military surplus strike hawks and even century old misc flying wings. Now they had a readily replaceable spacecraft that would fit in their budget. An analysis soon found that the Cutlass were soonly transporting narcotics, raiding cargo convoys, and even daring to engage police patrols with increasing frequency. It had become clear, through wholly unacknowledged, the company had realized they had made a deal with the devil, and the money was too good to step back. Instead of restricting Cutlass sales to recognized military units, they began designing spacecraft with increasingly piratical bent. The Caterpillar Transport, for instance, mounted more tractor beams and heavy weapons than anything in the same class. Advertising became more obvious as well, with showroom model cutlasses appearing in black stealth schemes with skull and crossbone logos. So Drake Interplanetary ships are the Buccaneer, the Caterpillar, the Cutlass, the Dragonfly, the Herald, and the, uh, the Marauder, and the Privateer. So, MISC, Industrial, and Starflight Concern. Origins. 
The Mustachi Industrial and Starflight Concern, known as MISC, was formed in 2805 in an arranged business merger between the uh, failing Halo Hato Electronics Corporation and the Musashi Lifestyle Design Unit spin-off of Acorn Limited. The merger made smart use of Hato's extensive network of large-scale production facilities and Musashi's reputation for design genius. MISC is based on the Sayasi in the Centauri system. Corporate offices are located here, as well as impressive central dealership facility that is fully open to the public. MISC is also known for their especially economic factories. With every spacecraft piece assembled robotically with expert precision, fully modular identical production lines have been established on dozens of worlds. For most of the company's history, the majority of businesses has come from production output of their heavy industrial division. MISC HI is responsible for a range of configurable bolt transport spacecraft, which is a ubiquitous in the UEE space. These sturdy modular hulls are the basis for the majority of human corporate shipping. Their unexpected popularity among the Zian, or the Zian, sorry about that folks, has sprawled an unlikely business relationship. A string of emitters on the other side of the border, four standard hulls are as mass-produced ranging in size from efficient uh, MISC A to the gargantuan MISC D. MISC is the only human spacecraft corporation to sign a land lease agreement with the GN, agreed to a closed door conference in 2910. Although the actual specifics of the deal have remained a tightly held trade secret, insiders suggest the GN technology has played heavily into the freelancer development. All seemingly Xi'an produced MISC hull Ds are becoming an increasingly common sight at border outposts. While the rumors claim that the MISC's, hull, uh, MISC's next line of spacecraft will begin to incorporate Xi'an thruster or Xi'an thruster technologies adapted for use in their human craft. In recent years, MISC has funneled profits from their corporate line in development of two spacecraft that are normally marked for personal use the Freelancer and the Starfarer. These spacecraft are aimed to compete in a crowded marketplace against heavyweights like Robert Space Industries and Drake Interplanetary. Nevertheless, a carefully managed business plan and a one-two punch of generalized private craft, the Freelancer, a role-specific niche ship, the Starfarer, have found overwhelming success for the company in this area. The GN Connection when asked, does the UEE get any tech from the Banu or other races? Is there any re-engineering alien technology for human use? Dave Haddock responded with yes. For example, the MISC is a human Gian joint company. The Vandal size that our UEE sold off had to be redesigned for human pilots. So, MISC ships are the Endeavor, the uh, Fiera, the Freelancer, the Hope class floating hospital, the whole A, the whole B, the whole C, the whole D, the whole E, the Prospector, the Reliant, and the Starfarer. History Anvil Aerospace is one of the earliest Terran success stories. Founded in 2772, Anvil has been reliably delivering military-grade equipment to the UEE Navy for almost two centuries. The initial Anvil Scout Works facility is located in the Nova Kev, Terra. The company's headquarters are still there. For the first 70 odd years of Anvil's existence, every design project was personally led by company founder J. Harris Arnold. Arnold was an eccentric spacecraft designer of the old school, who insisted on signing off every part of his design subsystems, and was a beloved figure in an otherwise cutthroat industry. Today, Anvil has factories on three dozen UE core worlds but continues to source all subsystems itself and requires that the standing CEO sign off on every spacecraft alteration. The company's moniker comes from a quote in Robert Seville's famous early justification for UEE expansion, explaining the military spending fuels the furnaces of expansion and strikes the anvils of innovation. There is little argument fueling the furnaces of expansion is exactly what Anvil has been doing since day one. The company has produced dozens of successful iconic military spacecraft over the years, including the Hurricane, the Devastator, the Hornet, and the Gladiator. 
No military campaign for the last two centuries has been launched without an Anvil spacecraft in the forefront. And no carrier in the UEE space today operates without at least a squadron of Anvil Design fighters. In fact, Anvil Designs have historically scored more space-to-space -space kills than any other military spacecraft. Hornets in particular have destroyed more enemy hardware measured in star credits than any other current naval space fighter design combined. Civilian Craft Anvil Civilian Line is a relatively new decision that many of the company initially resisted. The general feeling was that producing civilian grade versions of dedicated military spacecraft would dilute the brand. Anvil's carefully maintained position as the tip of the spear would be in danger. Debate over the issue became so protracted that it threatened to split the company into two separate groups. With the civilian wing formally licensing the military designs, this was the ultimately all for naught. As the UE government stepped into the debate with a surprising resolution, they actually favored the concept of supplying military styled weaponry to civilians especially those on distant frontiers. A home defense militia of slightly less than mil-spec, but still fearsome hornets, make a better deterrent than a squadron of Drake cutlasses. The process of civilianizing a design like the Hornet is more complex than it seems. The UEE military secrecy laws mean that on average 60% of the hardware in a given spacecraft simply cannot be offered to the public. Some of these replacements, like mil-spec Gatling guns, would be expected and relatively easy to resource in modular design. But these requirements also govern systems as innocuous as rudder pedal boot locks or rubber cockpit ceiling strips. Design teams must effectively work double-blind, replacing existing systems without being given access to their military equivalents. In some cases, designers must reconstruct subsystems based solely on publicly available holographs, while the team that designed the original system operates next door, wholly unaware. Civilianizing the top-of-the-line spacecraft is a frustrating process, but one that has proved ultimately valuable for Anvil. Company profits rose 34% after the first civilian model Hornet, EF-7C, was made available, with no perceptible tarnishing of the Anvil brand. Rather, the idea that you could own a military ship was immediately became something of a status symbol, driving the resale value of Hornets and successive conversion. Civilian Hornets have essentially and unexpectedly become a luxury brand. Anvil's civilian headquarters sell both to actual parliamentary units on the frontier, desperately in need of rugged hardware, to the rich homeworld industrialists who believe that flying a Hornet makes him a Top Gun fighter pilot. The future. Terra, home of Anvil Aerospace, with both military and civilian spacecraft spending at an all-time high, Anvil's prospects look bright as the UEE continues to face off against seemingly growing vandal threats. Orders for Hornets, Space Superiority Fighters and Gladiator Bombers continue to spike. Several thousand of each are delivered to the frontline carriers every month, at a rate that continues to rise as an additional factories can be brought online. On the civilian side, the uh, Hornet is holding steady as the third best-selling single-seat spacecraft design available trumped only by the Aurora and the 300i. The recent civilian conversion of the Gladiator looks to be a similar success story, as the first model Gladiator 1 becomes available to the general public in the next three months. So, ships that Anvil Aerospace produce are the Carrick, the Crucible, the Gladiator, the Hornet, the Lightning, and the Terrapin. So, last and certainly not least, Robert Space Industries. So, let's have a look here. Robert Space Industries, RSI, has two centuries, one in the real world and the other in the virtual world, is the legal world of RSI, it is a sub-century division of Cloud Imperial Games Corporation. In the virtual world of Star Citizen, RSI is the creator of a quantum drive that kickstarted humanity's expansion into space. They are known for their wide range of spaceships that serve all your needs starting at basic interstellar travel to deep exploration on the outer edges of the galaxy. So RSI's in-game history, 
In 2113, RSI released the first Atmo processing device capable of terraforming. In 2140, they RSI released the Zeus, the first spacecraft both capable of short distance flight and affordable enough for purchase by anyone other than the super wealthy. 2214. RSI released the Poseidon, a new generation of spacecraft capable of speed that is one-tenth the speed of light. It also introduced the augmented hydrogen scrubber, which facilitated fuel collection while in flight. RSI products. So the ships they have designed are the Aurora, the Bengal-class carrier, the Constellation, the Mover Transport, the Nova, the Orion, the Pegasus-class escort carrier, the Polaris-class corvette, the Torch, the X-7, the Zeus. So that about wraps it up for Star Citizen's ship manufacturers. Thank you guys so much for watching. This has been another video. And yeah, uh, thank you guys so much for supporting the channel with your like subscriptions and your likes. It really does make all the difference. Let's see if we can get to 3,000. And uh, yeah, uh, let's see how long we can keep all this going. A video a day for you guys. And uh, as of at the moment, I've almost reached 100 Star Citizen videos and every single one of those has had no advertisements and has been for free. So you are welcome. <laughs> Thank you guys yet again for supporting the channel. It, it does mean the world to me and you guys have been absolutely amazing. So you guys know the drill. Fly safe commanders and I'll see you in the verse.